Today on Lockdown Red Wings, Joe Valeno inks a new deal and discussing the impacts Beargren and Ghost Despair could have in the new season. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J-A-W-W-J News Radio podcast. Well, Scott is host over at Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And on today's episode, guys, well, first, actually, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And on today's episode, guys, for real this time, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Joe Valeno's new one-year contract. I won't go too deep on him. We already previewed him in an earlier episode. Um, but then we will also do a, a preview of Jonathan Bergen, one of the exciting young guys. Young, I guess he's not really a prospect anymore. He played 60 games with the Wings last season. So he's officially in his sophomore season. And then as well, we'll talk about newcomer Shane Ghost Despair and discuss what kind of impact we think he could have on the back end with his offensive upside. Uh, Scotty, happy Friday. How you doing? Carpenter's uh, raking, buddy. Yeah, man. Doing uh, doing pretty well. A lot of rain. Goodness. Let's get more. The Yeah, I know. The storms have been nuts. I guess, like, I don't really just want <laughs> to... We're close enough that we don't have to do, like, small talk about the weather. But, like, it has been... It's been crazy. Um, but, no, doing pretty well. Doing pretty well, man. Yes, I'm glad to hear that. I'm doing well, too. Uh by the time this comes out, it's a Friday episode, and everybody loves Friday. Thank God it's Friday. And uh, let's just dive right into things, Scotty, not waste any more time. Joe Valeno, about an hour after we finished recording our episode on As always. Tuesday. It's Thursday by, by the time we're recording this now. So he signed a contract on Tuesday, and you're going to hear us talk about it on Friday because he decided to sign that contract <laughs> an hour after we recorded. And I was not going to re-record uh, that episode again. So we're going to talk about him again. It's not like it was Dylan Larkin signing the extension or anything, people. Uh, no disrespect to Joe Valeno, but let's let's be real here. Uh, Valeno and RFA, the last remaining contract, the last remaining free agent RFA that Steve Eiserman had to sign, signed a one-year eight point. Uh, I almost said eight point two million, but wow, eight hundred twenty-five thousand dollar contract Joe, man. with the Detroit Red Wings, and that's a pay decrease. Uh, that's. Almost a hundred thousand actually is a hundred thousand dollars less than his cap hit in his initial season with the Detroit Red Wings. And his it, it's a solid geez, like four hundred thousand dollars less from his average value on his entry level contract. So a huge pay cut to Joe Valeno in his new one year deal. And I mean, not to talk about, like, we're not going to preview him. We already did that. You can go back and listen to our player preview on Joe Valeno that we did a couple weeks ago. We're not going to talk about where he slotted in the line, or he's going to slot in the lineup, or what he's going to bring. But, like, why the pay cut? I mean, that's really the point of the con conversation. Not that he deserved a pay raise necessarily, but to go down to $825,000 on a one-year deal, I mean, I feel like that speaks, va uh, speaks volumes, Scotty, about what the organization feels with his development right now. Yeah. You know, I, well, first off, I, I think, <laughs> you know, you were like, you know, it's not Dylan Larkin or whatever. The reason why it wasn't a big deal is not necessarily because the contract wasn't signed is because at the end of the day, to your point, he was an RFA. Like they, this was always going to happen at some point. It just took a little bit longer than expected. There was no way that they, like it was, it would have been impossible pretty much for them to not work out some sort of deal. So that was, was the biggest one of the biggest things. The biggest thing was absolutely that the the, the number for AAV is what it is. Um, I, I mean, I've, yeah, like we've talked about a lot like on this show since I want to say like December of last year. Like we've kind of been highlighting like, hey, this is like not, he, he's really not taking any like steps forward. He's not taking a having a big uptick in production or, or development. It doesn't seem like this is kind of just the same thing over and over. We know we're going to get every night, but it's not necessarily someone who like we're, we're really desperate to pencil into the lineup every night. And I think that that is kind of the reason we're here. I also think it's the reason it took so long to sign pen to paper was because 
they were probably like, yeah, we're not going to give you a, a raise. And that's, <laughs> you know, for RFAs, that, that's relatively few and far between, especially for young players like that who are, uh, who are presumably trying to improve every year. But Valeno hasn't improved every year of his career. Like he, he I don't know. I, 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 it's not like the most shocking thing to me once I see it, uh, but it certainly is, is something that's noteworthy. Yeah, without a doubt. I, I was shocked that he didn't get like $1 million because I feel like that's what a lot of the models were projecting and kind of where, I mean, for a bridge deal, it's kind of where you'd think he'd go. I, I do wonder, and this is just pure speculation, I do wonder, Scotty, if, or how much, rather, the stomp, the infamous stomp, uh, plays into the fact that he got a pay cut. Like, what, how pissed was Iserman at that situation? And, like, did he feel it, like, embarrassed the organization? Again, this is just pure speculation on my point, part. Like, there's no evidence to back up. That's why he got such a significant pay cut. But you do think, like, even though, I mean, eisman has gone out and said, like, he still believes that Joe Valeno has it in, has it in him to be a, a strong everyday, you know, center in the NHL, yet then you reward that sentiment with $800,000. Not saying he deserved more, because I actually think that's pretty fair value for what he was getting. It's just shocking to see that big of a pay cut on a young player, and then it also being a one-year deal on top of that. I feel like this was a Steve Eisman's like, listen, your production on your entry-level contract hasn't been up to snuff. Um, so this is what we're offering you. And then Joe, Joe Valeno is like, well, I don't want that for multiple years. So I'm going to bet on myself here. Not that, I mean, I think he's still going to be an RFA at the end of this, but this is very much a, a very important bridge deal for Joe Valeno because let's face it. And you talked about it too, Scotty, this past season with the Detroit Red Wings, he was pretty invisible out there. Uh, the bulk of the season, he looked like a fourth line center at his best. And looking at the Red Wings' new depth, I, I mean, we have only seen one game out of Marco Casper, but we know he was playing well in the SHL. Marco Casper, when he's ready to come up, I'm, I'm finding, I can't find an argument to play Joe Valeno in, at center over Cop or Comfer or Casper or obviously not Larkin, but you get my point. Like he's already kind of in the same, he occupies the same headspace or space in my mind rather that a Gustav Lindstrom did, which unfortunately is getting to a point where it's expendable, which sucks because what two years ago was, we were talking about how Joe Valeno is ready for the NHL. Cause he was kind of tearing it up at the AHL level. Like this is a guy that we were so excited for yet. His development has not really come nearly as far as we hoped. And here we are with just $800,000 and I'm not trying to write him off. He's only 23 and, Players can break out and turn around. This is going to be a very important year for him. That's why it's a one-year deal. It's a bridge deal. It can be. This could be the year he breaks out. But just look at the weighted data that has that Jay Fresh has provided on. I'll make sure I get the right tab this time on Joe Valeno. It, it, it does not. Show, it does not show a very effective center in the NHL. He's above average defensively, but almost nothing offensively, and he doesn't get a lot of opportunities. Yeah, man, I, I I think you're right that this year is a really important year. We've been saying that all offseason for Valeno. Um, I, I also like the one-year thing doesn't surprise me from anybody's perspective. Like Valeno, obviously, if that's the AAV, was never going to like you know lock up long-term with, with that price tag. And, and in the same breath, the Wings, why on earth would they lock up Valeno long-term? Yeah. Like that he has, he has proven – nothing at the NHL level to give them the confidence of a multi-year deal like this this that part doesn't surprise me at all I would have been shocked if it wasn't a one-year deal no matter what the AAV would have been um, but the AAV being as low as it is certainly kind of I don't know I, I, I do think it speaks some some volumes especially because it's not like the wings are like right up against the cap <laughs> like they they, they could have just and they're not like signing anybody from like now to opening night really you know what I mean like they could have pretty easily just like bent the knee and been like, all right, whatever. Like, we'll, we'll give you that. It's only a one year deal and we have the money for it anyway. And they <laughs> made a point to, to, and there's, that's obviously way more complicated than that. I, I understand that, but they, they made a point to, to make sure that he got a lower salary this year than last year. And again, like at the end of the day, if it's just pure, look at what he did last year, point total, these numbers, et cetera, and what you think he should be paid. 
I think the salary they agreed on is his value. And if that's all that, that mattered to the front office at the end of the day, then that's why we're here. Yeah, I mean, his projected war percentile, for those of you who are, aren't watching and are listening on Spotify or any other method that you can do so, uh, 31% is his overall war percentile across the last two years of weighted data. And uh, his offense was 5% and his defense is 61%. So he's an above average defensive center, but that's that's not why you drafted Joe Valeno. That's not what you brought him in for. And when, you know, yes, it's, not surprising that he only got paid $800,000 when you look at the pure production standpoint. I, I definitely am not going to disagree with that. I think that is, you know, pretty worth his production and it's going to be a huge prove it year. But it is surprising from the aspect of we're one year removed of a uh, Philip Zadina extension that saw him get over a million dollars for three years. So that's why it's surprising to me because usually these RFAs, they don't Has get Elena been better than, than Zadina. Now that's a can of worms. I'm not willing to open. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I I don't think it's that complicated personally. I'll just put it out there. I don't, I don't think that's rocket science. I, I listen there. Those are apples and oranges, I guess. And I guess that's a, the, the point you're trying to make, but uh, you know, when you draft one guy, what 31st overall or 30, sure. I'm not saying expectations six, aren't way different. And, I'm and just talking production number is the same Pure production. <laughs> I mean, Valeno had eight goals last year. And how many did Zadina had? I'm not counting this year because Zadina was obviously hurt so much. I think it was probably out the same. But anyways, getting off topic, we got to go to a quick break and get to Giannis and Bear Grin. That's the news. Let us know what you think of the Bear Grin contract. Do you think it's too much? Do you think it's too little? What What do you make of it, guys? Let us know in the comments below. Uh, stay tuned to Lockdown Red Wings. I got to talk to you guys today about FanDuel. Football season is about to kick off, and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long because right now when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl, and you'll get bonus bets for every victory. You can use those bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty, let's talk about Jonathan Bergen. He's an exciting player to talk about. I'm I'm pumped for this conversation because I'm pumped about Jonathan Bergen. Uh, he came up last year and he showed flashes. Consistency, obviously, with his age. It was his rookie season last year. He, inconsistent. Sometimes he was great, sometimes not so much. But overall, very promising rookie season from him. He had 28 points in 67 games played. He saw time all over the lineup. And no matter what line he was on, and this is the thing that makes me super excited for Jonathan Berggren. He made that line he was on better. I remember there were times he was playing with guys on the fourth line who just I don't want to I don't want to talk bad about players who are already way better than me, but kind of expendable players. Let's say that. Expendable right. players on the fourth line and he was making that line do stuff in the offensive zone. You know, create opportunities and opening the doors for his teammates. He made every line he was on better. And I think an off season where he can get stronger and he has more experience. I'm pumped to see what Jonathan Bergen can do in his sophomore season. I'm absolutely pumped. Yeah. I'm really excited as well. This is a, a guy who has really proven that at a young age, he is, is probably going to be able to find the back of the net at a decent clip. Um, Last season, 67 games, 15 goals as a 22-year-old rookie. Uh, had 13 assists with that, so 28 points in 67 games. Uh, again, just 22 years old. Like he's he he really impressed a lot. I think a similar conversation, maybe not as extreme, but a similar conversation is probably to be had with him about, like you said, getting bigger. Um, not getting knocked off the puck and whatnot. We we obviously have talked a lot about Raymond with that. I think that there's somewhat of a similar conversation with Bergeron in that. But um, I, I mean, I'm unbelievably excited of a just like 82 games uh, of Bergeron and not having to deal with like the oh, are they going to call him up? What's going to happen? You know, kind of nonsense that we've been dealing with him for the last couple of years. Um, just like he's here, he's in the lineup. Let's see what he does uh, for, for a full season. That's like first and foremost, really what I'm most excited for. But yeah, another off season of maturing, you know, presumably getting a little bit better. I, I think that this could be a really, really solid season for, for Berger. 
I mean, and the big question is, is can he break into the top six and stay there? Because if I'm being honest, Scotty, I, I think this kid has a legitimate shot of being a top six forward in this, in this. And what's cool about ghost or coast is bear. Not talking about him yet. Bergeron <sighs> is he can play both sides of the wing and he has already in the NHL. And you, we talked about on like line two the other day, you have copper Comfer as your center, right? We, we don't know which one, but it's going to be copper Comfer. You're pretty sure you're going to have Raymond on the right side because him and Debrinkit probably won't be a great idea on line one. But even let's say, let's say Raymond does play on line one. Then you have Perron on line two and then an opening on the other side. That could be Berggren. Or if Raymond's on line two, could that be Berggren on line one? I know I'm getting ahead of myself with that take, but I do think this kid's really good. He has great vision. And that's the one thing that stood out to me time and time again when he was out there. When he had the puck, it felt like he was seeing the ice a step ahead of the rest of the team. His ability to just produce opportunities for his teammates and maintain the puck. I, again, getting tougher so he doesn't get knocked off the puck is going to be big for him. Um, but that's just, that will come with age, right? He's going to get bigger. He's going to get more experience. But his ability to possess the puck, hold on to the puck, see where his teammates are at, and produce opportunities from them was huge. In his 67 games last year, Scotty, he had a 56th percentile at goals above replacement at even strength, um, or overall rather. Uh, yeah. He was a 59th percentile goals above replacement player at offense and a 57th percentile goals above replacement at defense. So he was above average, a slightly above average player at offense and defense in 67 games, give him more minutes and time with better line mates this season. And I think that goes up. I, I really, I think I don't want to say the sky's the limit for Berggren. I don't think that highly of him, but I do think that he is sneaky, a sneaky good candidate for top six minutes with the Red Wings this season. I, he's got such such hidden potential, I feel. Yeah, I think there is maybe an opening there. I I, I think it'll the the part that I appreciate about the team going into this year is that all of those increased roles or like people that were like, oh, like maybe they could take a step forward or maybe they can get more minutes is the team is deep enough for the first time in a while where they, that will only happen if it is proven. Like, th this is not going to be in a situation where Bergeron has to be a top six forward on opening night. And, you know, it, the, whatever, the moment might be too big or, like, it's too big of a jump or whatever. Like, that, that's not, like, a necessity. Like, this team is will, will be able to, to run smoothly, presumably, w w you know, no matter where Berger is in the lineup. And so... That's the part that I, I am excited for and appreciate the most about not only the, the Berggren situation, but really this whole lineup when we talk about any of these guys. It's like this is this is a, a team that, you know, it's not, I'm not trying to make it sound like it's the deepest team in the NHL or anything very far from it. But compared to the last several seasons, they're finally at a point where, you know, it's not like, oh, well, just like give them more minutes because why not? Like that's that's no longer a thing. Like there's legitimate players kind of top to bottom and, and or at least people that we expect something of top to bottom. And uh, Bergeron is certainly one of those players. And so I think if he does take that jump, it'll be because he's earned it. And that's, that's kind of awesome. Yeah. I mean, his relative Corsi four per 60 minutes was at 2.63. So that means per 60 minutes of ice time that when he was on the ice, the team generated almost three more shot attempts first when he was off the ice. Right. So I mean, that just is another another point in my category of like he's the team's better when he's in, when he's on the ice no matter what line he was playing on now if you were to weight that expected goals which is quality of shot attempts it is a minus 0.5 so there is something to be said about the quality of the shot attempts that were taken when he was on the ice um but overall more shot attempts when Jonathan Bergeron's on the ice I just Scotty, he's probably one of the players I'm most excited to watch this season. Obviously, I'm excited to watch, you know, Debrinkit as number one in his first season with the sure. the in the winged wheel. I'm excited for see what Raymond can do if he can bounce back. Obviously, Cider, but I would say Berggren's like number four on that list, just because I I really think he's poised for a big breakout season. I don't think it's a hot take to say that, and you brought it up like the depth is is there enough that if he's playing top six minutes is because he will have earned it. And I'm confident enough saying that I think he will earn lot second line minutes in, in this. I don't know if it'll be like consistent every single day, but 
against his teammates, I think line two could be in the realm of possibility. I think that is something that he can and will get. Um, and not just like a one-off here and there. I mean, I'm talking about multiple games, like a, over a dozen games yeah. at line two, because yeah, I don't hate it. I, I think he has that kind of potential. It's all going to come down to, you know, how much better did he get in the off season? I, I, I don't hate it at all. Really? That's good. That's awesome. Uh, Scotty, we're going to take another quick break unless you have anything else to add on Bear Grin. I don't think I do. All right. We'll take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to move on to Shane Ghost to spare the final player of our player previews, the newcomer. So stay tuned to Locked on Red Wings. Segment three, Locked on Red Wings podcast. Scotty, let's move on to talking about Shane Ghostis Bear uh, last season with the Carolina Hurricanes and Arizona Coyotes. Uh, he had a total of 41 points in 75 games played. He had 13 goals and 20 eight assists uh, and had a plus minus differential. If you guys care about that, you shouldn't of negative five. Um, he's an offense first defenseman. He is a veteran on a one year deal with the Detroit Red Wings for 4.125 million. We kind of talked about this a little bit when we broke down the newcomers back when free agency started. Um, I mean, we, I guess the conversation with ghost despair kind of leans into how big of an impact do we see him having? I mean, we think he is, you know, line two caliber player, uh, to pair two caliber player with the Detroit Red Wings, but people's opinions vary. Some people think he'll be on pair three, but on power play two. Where do you see him having the greatest impact? You know, I genuinely, I would be pretty surprised if he wasn't line two power play two or pair two power play two. I, I think. Uh, it's it's really hard to go off of cider and like you shouldn't go off of cider on on power play one, but uh, he he's a he's a phenomenal like defensive quarterback back there. You know what I mean? Like I I think that that's kind of the, the the role that he's made for. I I think that he which is awesome. The fact that you're you have multiple power play units who the defender that you're sending out there you're like very confident in is awesome. And it's been a long time since we've really been that confident in that. Um, so that's, that's great. Two thumbs up. Uh, and then, you know, on even strength, I, I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I look at the rest of the the blue line. I think he's a slam dunk for second pair. I, I have a very hard time doing like enough mental gymnastics to jump to the conclusion that he won't be on pair two. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you, honestly. I think that he is going to be a, a, a pair to defenseman. They're going to give him more minutes, more opportunities to score, get as many points as possible. And, you know, obviously chemistry is going to matter, matter a lot. I do think that, you know, as the season progresses, nothing's set in stone and nothing's permanent. I think he will find time on pair number pair three. I'm uh, sure he will. Just like I, I think this season's going to be a lot of rotation around the lineup as it is always year, but more so when you bring in this many new bodies, you got to figure out where people are best suited. But I think ghost will spend most of his time on pair number two, who he's with is another conversation. And we tried to figure that out when we did the lines before, but the addition of Petrie, I think that uh, complicates things a little bit further. Uh, Cause I, I would love a, a ghost Petrie pair, but ghost also takes about 50% of his ice time on the right side. So there's so many options for him as a defensive pair. And I think that will have a huge impact on where he plays in the lineup. But regardless, I think, I don't think his minutes really change all that much. Pair two versus pair three, obviously pair one is going to be cider and Wallman until they prove otherwise. And so I don't know, man, I, I don't, it didn't, but that doesn't matter, right? Like we're, we're talking semantics on where he could be slotted. I think he's a lock for about 40 points. I think if, he comes in and he gives you 40 points like he did last season playing with one, the Arizona coyotes and then the Carolina hurricanes who were all a good, really good hockey team. Cause they he got traded at the deadline. I mean, if you can do that with the coyotes, bulk of that with the coyotes, 40 points with the red wings, I think is, isn't too, too far, too big of an ask. He had 31 points and 10 goals in 52 games with the Arizona coyotes. Yeah. <laughs> like he's, he's really a dog, man. And, and his, in a full season with Arizona, 82 games played in uh, in 2021, 2022, he had 14 goals and 51 points. Yikes! With Arizona, man, like he is, he's 10. Jeez, <laughs> he's 
He's the man. He really is the man. And so, like, I, obviously, we've talked about this a lot. We've talked about the addition of him uh, at length this uh, th- this offseason already. I think if he puts up, yeah, I guess 40, 40, sure. I'm just looking at, like, his career, like, yearly totals. I mean, if he put if he put up 37 or more, I'd be pretty pleased. That would be like around 10 goals. Like he had a season in Philly where he put up 37 points, nine goals, 28 assists. I think that would be this working. I think that would be the uh, uh, a good solid number. And that was like his one of his lowest years shooting percentage wise too that season. Like I, I think that if if he somewhat goes around that production, that that's a win. I do think that. It will be a revolving door on the blue line. We've said that a million times already. I mean, he's locked to make the. He's, he's not like a seventh defenseman. You know, no, no, guy. no, no. But I, I think to your point about him being able to play both sides, like there's several defenders on this team now that you can put on both sides. Good problem. Plus the addition of Petrie, like I, I think they really are going to mix and match these pairings so so much, and so. Uh, I I don't think that it's a solidified like he'll be the left second pair all year, or the right second pair all year, or whatever, uh, wherever you think he's going to slot in. But I I do agree with you that he's probably going to get third pair minutes at some point. He's probably uh, going to get. Uh, I mean, he's probably going to play all over the place on, on both sides and on multiple pairings. So that's exciting. That's needed. That's like a that's a plus attribute. So, yeah, I'm again, like I've said it before, but this is like one of, if not the like my favorite acquisition of the entire offseason. Yeah, absolutely. And and what's interesting, too. So in 82 games with the Coyotes the season before, he had 51 points. So, like, and and I know a lot of that sometimes can be like you're playing on a really bad team. So, like, screw defense. Let's go up the ice and score Eric Carlson. Um, So. But I think it does speak volumes that last year with the Coyotes, as bad as they were, he was he was relative Corsi per 60 was 1.92. Yeah. So per 60 minutes of ice time, this, he provided two shot attempts or when he was out there, the team generated two, sh- two more shot attempts, two more shot attempts for than against. Now, again, expected goals was minus 0.60. So the quality of those shot attempts maybe wasn't quite there, but that's, that's if you even, Oh, I'm sorry. The relative expected goals per 60 was point negative point zero six. So like just barely when you talk about quality shot attempts was a little bit weighted to the negative, but man, this team just needs shot attempts, right? Like we, we got to <laughs> shoot the puck more. We got to outshoot the opponent. We got to play better defense. And like, not that ghost this bear is like the most sound defensively. That's not what you brought him in for. And you have other guys that you brought in to help do that. along with other guys along the way, but like, you know, Again, we, we talk about how some signings mirror last offseason. We talked about how, you know, Daniel Sprong was that sneaky underrated signing on the offense. I mean, Ghost Despair, well, I don't know if Ghost Despair is an underrated signing. I, th- I would say Mata was the underrated right, signing yeah. last year. Ghost Despair is an in your face, hey, this is a player that you can be excited <laughs> about to watch. Plus, one year deal. So if he's producing and, God forbid, you know, you're not in the playoff race, you can flip him for assets just like the right. Coyotes did last year. So, there's a couple things to be excited about with Ghost of Spare, but overall, I'm just excited to see him hit the ice and add some points on the blue line. Somebody besides Cider and Woolman to get some points on this blue line. Let's go. <laughs> Brian loves his uh, his, his point-producing defenders, for sure. I love defensemen. I have been a defenseman my, enti- my entire life. Uh, not a good one, but I've been one. And so uh, they always are my favorite players on the ice. Yeah, so I get excited. Brian has an elite prospects page. Thank you, Scotty, for reminding everybody of that, the, of Case my in, uh, of the inner inaccurate statistics that are on it too. The, yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, the goal. It's sad that you me. announced your retirement, man. That's I, I love that. I love that it says I'm retired. <laughs> I, I must have missed the presser. That, that's too bad. Th- well, the flip side of the argument was I ever active? Like, let's be honest here. I played. Yeah, I, I played four games with active. this team because they were hard so to play a game when you're not active, dude. Have I told the full story about how I played those four games? Yes. Okay. Like they were so banged up <laughs> that they were just like, I was a men's league player. I was like 21 or something like that. And I was like, sure, I'll go on a trip to Chicago. Let's go. <laughs> but I did start prospects. the one game. Brian, uh, but I started the game as a forward, even though I played defense my entire life. That's kind of baller. Yeah. What can't I, he do? 
what can't he do? I was, I was a jack of all trades, truly a master of none. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, Scotty. So, yes, the rosters for the prospects tournament came out. We're going to go over that on Monday because we're still a couple weeks away from the prospects tournament. So we're not in any rush to burn through content <laughs> when we, we're still got episodes to give you guys. So we'll cover the prospects tournament roster and who is and who isn't there as there's some interesting players that aren't coming and we'll explain to you guys why. Um, any final thoughts, Scotty? We ball. We do ball. We'll be back with a new episode on Monday. Same time, same place to your team every day. Every day. Scotty's got a big head.